This video is brought to you by BetUS Sportsbook and Casino. Welcome back, everybody, to Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast also heard on the radio in Las Vegas, the home of the Raiders. That's right. We you can be heard on Sundays on 101.5 FM, KDON, and over on The Bet on HD2. So thanks and welcome to our Listeners in Las Vegas, if you're watching us on YouTube or wherever you're watching us, make sure you hit that subscribe button. If you don't already subscribe to the podcast, because we don't just do the show on radio on Sundays, we do the podcast all week long and during the season, several days a week. So make sure you subscribe wherever you get your audio. Don't forget to rate and comment as well. So we appreciate that as well. I am Scott Cobranson, your host, along with my co-host, that is Mr. Mo Moten. He is a senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report. Also, star of television and, and, and soon to be the movies. Oh, I kid about that. But he's actually on television. You catch him on TNT. We will always give you that schedule. He also is the Raiders columnist up on sportsnot.com where you can find my work in addition to other things as well. So thanks for being with us. All right, Mo. Well, we're going into preseason week two. And you and I were talking before we got on the air. A little quiet out there, right? You got this quarterback battle going on. We talked a lot about that last show as we, we recapped the game, uh, but not much going on. They signed Nathan Peterman because, you know, they needed another quarterback that's not going to play. <laughs> and so they signed Nathan Peterman. I have no idea why. Um, and uh, maybe because they think they need a veteran on the squad because, of course, uh, Aiden O'Connell. Yeah, technically he's a veteran, but he's only in year two. And then, of course, you have Gardner Minshew. And so maybe they're just hedging their bets. They don't like what they saw with Anthony Brown. And uh, and so they want to figure some things out. But uh, again, been been quiet on that QB battle. Uh, I'm so I'm a little bit surprised. But at the same time, you look at and I don't always gauge the Raiders because we always talk about it on the show by national coverage. But the national coverage is not real impressed with the quarterback battle in Las Vegas. They cover it, but they're not making a big story out of it because it's not that exciting. And so even. In Raider Nation, it seems like people are like, yeah, well, you know, whatever. So two things about the Raiders signing Nathan Peterman. I'll go serious and half serious on this one. <laughs> the serious note is Nathan Peterman knows the playbook. He was in Chicago with Luke mm -hmm. Getze last year. So he's familiar. And I think I think what the Raiders are seeing here, and a lot of people were kind of hammering Anthony Brown, you probably want to have your third emergency quarterback be someone who knows the playbook just in case he gets thrown into it. Then, you know, he doesn't have to learn anything. He already knows the playbook. So I think he's going to be QB three when, when it's all said and done. The half serious note about Nathan Peterman is our guy, Matt Holder, who's at Bleacher Report and Silver Black Pride. That's that, that, that's Matt's guy. And I, and yes. I blame Matt ever since Matt <laughs> had that, that profile pic of him wearing a Nathan Peterman Jersey, the Raiders have not been able to get rid of him. So I blame this, Mostly yeah. on Matt Holder. Shout right. out to Matt Holder, by the way. It's like having gum on the bottom of your shoe. You know how like yeah. you're trying to get it get off. It. Can't get it off. But yeah, no, it's a really good point. I, 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 my guess is a lot of fans didn't realize that the Chicago piece and that it is true. I mean, mm -hmm. just being familiar with the playbook is a big deal. And so having him there as a veteran, not saying he's going to light the world on fire, and he's not part of this QB battle at all, but he's there, and so it makes a lot of sense. And he doesn't cost you a lot of money, right? So that's uh, even better for the Raiders, who, as we discussed last time, Mo, we haven't seen them make any roster moves as of the time that we're doing the show. And, of course, they're playing Dallas. Uh, and and so um, that makes you wonder about where this team is, where Tom Telesco and Antonio Pierce are with some of these positions. We talked about some of the lack of depth at defensive back last show. And uh, even though we saw some great performances, or not great, but very good performances out of Ja'Cory and and others, um, it seems like they're they're maybe going to wait until after this Cowboys game if they do at all, uh, or if they're thinking, I should say, at all about any moves to to bring in veterans either on defense or on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say is that if you remember last year, now there's only one cut down day. It used to be like rounds. Mm -hmm. Remember, used to cut down to certain uh, whatever the amount is of first round of cuts and the second round of cuts or the final round of cuts now it's one but last year if you remember after the second preseason game you start to see cuts trickle in right so i think you'll probably start to see the raiders trim the roster after the cowboys game they're also as Nintendo Pierce said going to make a big decision on the quarterback so th things are going to start to take shape 
the other thing is you can kind of figure out how they feel about Colton Miller and Jackson Powers Johnson coming back. Yeah. So if they sign more offensive linemen, maybe one or two, then that's not a good sign that, that Miller and Jackson Powers Johnson will be back right away. Antonio Pierce said he hopes that they're back after the Cowboys game. So look look out for the, the Raiders waiver that we've wired their their transaction wire is going to be very important to monitor after the Cowboys game because they'll let you know about injuries and how they feel about certain areas of the roster. And that collective cry you heard when they signed Nathan Peterman wasn't about Nathan Peter at Peterman. <laughs> it was the 18th uh, iteration of the Keelan Doss era that ended again. Oh, man. So, uh, yeah, he was cut, obviously, when they signed uh, um, and uh, Peterman. So, so yeah, I, th I think you're right, too. I think we'll see some of that start to move. We'll see some of these guys go. Um, interesting story um, as well was around uh, Trey Tucker, our good friend Vinny Bonsignor, who's going to be on the show, was supposed to be on last week and was driving back from camp, so we're working on getting him on the show. But he did a piece in the RJ – about Trey Tucker. And one of the things we talked about with Trey Tucker last year, and I have to bring this up with Vinny when he's on the show, um, because he he had some drops last year. He just did, right? And his piece actually talks about it, and I'll tell you why in a second. But in the story, Vinny said, well, he didn't have a problem with that in college, but if you go back and read every draft report on him coming in, he did have issues, especially with what they call fastballs in, in football, right? A, Ball, ball drilled right in there, dropped a lot of them, or it had intermittent issues with drops. And so what's really interesting about Vinny's story is that it turns out Trey Tucker in the offseason had LASIK eye surgery, Mo. So he was having some trouble. He didn't have 20-20 vision. So now with the LASIK surgery, um, the story talks about, it. I'll let you guys read it out there, but really interesting. Cause you know, you don't think about, you think about players and what they do. And these are great physical athletes, even though Trey Tucker's a small guy playing in the slot, still a great athlete, right? I mean, the guy bench presses like 600 pounds is strong dude. And, and we're, we're so quick to, oh, he's this, he's that. But in this case, he had a vision problem and now he's got it fixed. And, and maybe that's explains a little bit why we saw him come out so quickly in the first preseason game against Minnesota and look good. I think the way Vinny worded it was his depth of perception is better. Yeah. I think that that was the exact wording of it. And it make it, it would make sense, right? So if you have a vision issue, <laughs> you may the ball may not appear as close or far away as you think it is, right? It's kind of like when you're driving, right? You want to have good vision so you can perception of space, right? right. So I think yeah. that's part of the situation here with with Trey Tucker. The other thing is I remember there was a big story, I believe, two or three years ago. Jameis Winston also had LASIK eye surgery, and he yes. talked about that maybe possibly helping him. And people were saying, maybe we get a better version of Jameis Winston now that he can see. Because I remember watching Jameis Winston when he's with the Buccaneers. And there will be always photos of him squinting. And I'm like, either dude needs glasses or he needs <laughs> eye surgery because he's always squinting. And I, and I think as a quarterback especially, you know, you're throwing a ball, depth of perception again like a wide receiver. You need to be able to see. And mm -hmm. so maybe that helps Trey Tucker going forward. Who knows? And it's interesting because th th that whole idea of depth perception, I mean, think about it. Your job is to catch a football, right? You're a wide receiver. And here comes that brown ball, and you might be 15, 20 yards down the field, and it comes out of the quarterback's hand before you even look. And then you got to turn around and find it. And so, man, it, it really is remarkable. I mean, you think about it. And I know I'm geeking out here a little bit, but you think about it with all sports and just and, and the magic of the human eye and what you have to do and what guys have to do to be that good and to make it into pro level. So it was really good to see that. Uh, and I had no idea until I read Vinny's story. So very cool about Trey Tucker. I think it's something that's 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 interesting to keep an eye on to see if if he, if he's more consistent now uh, because of that. And and man, you could you don't know that for years, right? You might wear contacts or whatever. It's like, hey, that's just what you do. But then you get this done, this surgery, and suddenly, boom, you become a different player. So it'll be it'll be fun to watch and see if how much Trey Tucker has new eyes, right? I mean, all good. But um, I, I look at the at the Raiders too getting set for the Cowboys, Mo, and um, we talked a lot about obviously the quarterback things up front as well. We talked about the defense. We got a lot of feedback from listeners disagreeing with us about the Raiders on the run defense, and. I rewatched the film and 
I still thought that they got off slow. They had some nice plays too. It's like when we say that, by the way, folks out there, we don't mean on every play. I mean, there's some plays they play well. They got off their blocks and da da. But overall, we saw some of that delay. And I know we have some callers later, by the way, in the Raider Nation mailbag about that. So we'll we'll discuss it then. But I think that's the thing with 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 this when we evaluate what we see. And again, it's based on our own opinions. There's other people who might have different opinions. Uh, but when you look at that stuff, it's not to over, be overly critical and say that they don't have nice plays. It's all about, what's the word, Mo? Bring it up again. Consistency. Consistency. Thank you. And that's, I think, what we're talking about when we look at, for example, the last game and the run defense. Yeah, I, okay, I'm, we'll get into it in the mailback show. But I, regardless of what our opinion is, did you hear what AP said at the podium? He said that their run defense wasn't up to standard. Yeah, he said the run lanes they were out of place. What does he know? Lane. This is this is this is the head coach speaking, a defensive minded <laughs> yeah. head coach telling you that run defense wasn't up to par. So I, at that point, I don't I don't know what is there to argue. The head coach is telling you from his own mouth that it wasn't up to standard. Well, you're no fun. You don't give the negative Nancys out there any run. <laughs> our Karens are called now, right? I forgot. We live in a different era now. Uh, all right, we're gonna take our first break. <laughs> Here on Silver and Black today, uh, Odyssey Sports Original Podcast, also heard on 101.5 FM, KDON, and The Bet in Las Vegas, both Od Odyssey uh, Sports Stations. So we appreciate you guys all being with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about an issue with security at Allegiant Stadium for Raiders games. Yes, there's, there's, there's trouble brewing. We're going to tell you a little bit about that, and then we're going to quickly get, we got a long mailbag segment today. Because we were inundated with calls after this first game, and uh, we want to try to get as many as we can on. So we're going to do that for you, too. Sit where you are. We'll be back right after this. You're listening to Mo and Scott. This is Silver and Black Today. All right. Now, for our video audience, you guys should be should be ready for this uh, as we, we, we talk about our great partners over at um, BetUS. Right, Mo? I mean, are you ready? We're going to start doing picks when we get to the regular season because it's preseason and, and you know, you don't want to lose to me in the season. That would be terrible. So, um, <laughs> but we want to talk to you a little bit about BetUS because they are an official partner of ours this, this year. And if you haven't, look, we all like to bet. I mean, Mo, do you know any football, I mean, real football fans that, that aren't wagering now that it's become more ubiquitous? I would say most of the people in my circle, you know, uh, responsibly, of course, play some money on games, even preseason games. They may not be as out there as Kelly Kreiner uh, when it comes to preseason <laughs> betting. But, uh, you know, if their favorite team, whether it's the Jets Giants out here in New York City, they're, you know, they're putting money on their football team. There you go. And uh, I'll tell you, we I, I, we got we we have apps all over the place here in Ohio. We can do it. I've used FanDuel. I've used all that stuff. But I will tell you, BetUS is amazing. And so if you're looking for a new book this football season, come join us and uh, our, our fine partners over at BetUS. Uh, listen, they got the fastest payouts in the industry, which is important. 125% sign-up bonus up to $2,000. And that's three times using the link that you'll see below in the description. It's also pinned in the comment section of this video or in the podcast. So you can see it there too. So, uh, but it's fast, easy to deposit and you can withdraw your money quickly. You don't have to wait. It's not some weird, you know, sports book in like Diego Garcia. It's, 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 <laughs> it's there. You can get it. Uh, it's 24 seven personalized service. Also all major games, they have the best betting variety in the business. And I'm showing you here. I mean, we can click into the football mo which of course we can get into the week, but you can see here on the main page too, all the baseball, but even, even this, and I thought, and we don't talk politics on this show because 50% of people feel one way and 50% feel the other, but this is really interesting. Like you can, you can do political futures like crazy. You know, it, it's really interesting. I don't see you on here, Mo, for president. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I got to so, write my name. I got to call up that U.S. and tell them, to, <laughs> you know, hey, pencil my name in there since, you know, we're working together this year. True story. I was not happy with both candidates back when I was a little bit younger. And uh, I wrote in Eddie Van Halen. I did. I did. And you can call it a wasted vote, but that's who I wanted. So I did. But anyway, bet us, as I said, you can live wager on all games. You get 10% back on your losses every year. Uh, and also, did you know that they can give you your own personal account manager? Now, Midtown Mo has his own assistants. Most of us don't have personal managers, but 
at BetUS. You want one, they will give you one. So you get somebody there to help you all the time, uh, which is really great. So make sure you check out our BetUS link below in the description and get that bonus. Again, 125% sign-up bonus up to $2,000, and that's your first three deposits. So make sure you check out our buddies over at BetUS. And again, Mo and I are going to start doing a segment when the regular season starts uh, where we're going to go, we're going to go head to head and we're going to pick games every week and we'll see, we'll see who wins. I know he does that at Bleacher Report. You guys have your whole thing going there, but now we're going to do it here. So we'll see and we'll see if we can make our listeners some money. All right. Welcome back to Silver and Black today. Segment number two here. Uh, we're talking Raiders football, and uh, we are an Odyssey Sports original podcast, also heard on the radio in Las Vegas on 101.5 FMK Dawn and on the bet as well. So thanks for being with us. Um, got the Raider Nation mailbag, an especially long one this week coming up, so don't miss that. We got a lot of callers, some new callers from new parts of the country. It's good stuff, so stay tuned for that. Um, but, Mo, the one thing I wanted to bring up, and, and I'm going to have to read a little bit of this out of the, uh, off my screen here, so the Raiders have a very interesting situation brewing, and it's not really the Raiders. It's the NFL. But here's the headline from the Las Vegas Review Journal, and it's actually everywhere. If you search it, you'll see every major news outlet's covering it. NFL facial recognition policy upsets Las Vegas police union. The Las Vegas police union has raised concerns about a new NFL policy that would require officers who work security at Raiders games to share their photo for facial recognition purposes and is urging officers to think twice before complying. So really interesting here because if you guys have seen any of the coverage nationally, the NFL this year in all stadiums, so it's just not Allegiant Stadium, is introducing not only facial recognition for employees, and obviously this is where they, they, they hire a lot of police to come in and work for the games, but also for fans. You can be sitting in the, fan, in the stands, and let's say you do something crazy. You get in a fight. You and I know a lot of times people get in fights and they get taken out or whatever, but sometimes they get they get in fights, or we have uh, maybe some ladies who've drinking a little too much and they decide to show a little bit too much, like we saw during the Stanley Cup playoffs. Well, now they're capturing all this with these 3D cameras that 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 register biometrics. Now, again, I'm not overly paranoid, but that's some scary stuff. And so the police union in Las Vegas has said, whoa. So you're taking all these images of, of police officers, and even if they're working off the clock, so to speak, or they're working overtime is really what it is, uh, at Raider games, this company that's doing this for the NFL is going to have all this facial recognition stuff for police officers. So you, as you guys know, there's some people who have a negative view of the police. And so they're worried, and, and the, the, the gist of the story, Mo, is that they're kind of like, ah, they're trying to talk more to the NFL because they don't want to do it. And but it brought up the point to me that fans, I wonder how fans feel about it. So I, I'm going to ask Raider Nation out there how you feel about it. Now, I'm all for making places safer, right? With the world we live in today, we saw even, and it's hard for me to say her name, Taylor Swift, the whole plot to blow up or kill people at her concert in Austria. You know, it's a, it's a crazy place out there right now. Okay. So I'm all for making NFL stadiums safer. But you also start to think about, well, how far do you need to go? And um, I'm interested in that because it's like, I wonder I wonder how fans feel. I don't think any, I think some fans won't care at all. And I think some fans will be kind of like, ooh, what the heck? What are you doing with that data? It's not so much that they're doing it. It's what are you doing with the, this facial recognition that you capture of me, this biometrics. What are you doing with it afterwards? Because now biometrics, like, I don't know about you, Mo, but my iPhone, right? I do the face thing. And so suddenly, if somebody has a map of your face, they can suddenly open your phone. They can do all kinds of things. But I'm interested to hear your thoughts on it. And then, of course, all of you out there, leave comments. Let us know what you think. It's not going anywhere, Scott. I'll tell no, you, because no. I've, I've, seen, I've seen this in other places, and I was wondering you know, when it was going to start to become the norm. But you you just held up your phone, and we text all the time. We have iPhones. And you and you said it, right? When, you, when I open up my iPhone, you know, that's, you can disable this feature, but it's there's facial recognition on that to, to unlock your iPhone, right? You, it, before yeah. it was just putting your PIN number, what, you know, what have you now. You know, they're, basically, it's not, it's not going to roll back. Mm -hmm. You see with the iPhone, with the facial rec recognition, they're you know, talking about it now at the stadiums. This is the new way of the world. 
there there are certain things that happen, advances in technology that you can tell are not going to be rolled back. So you either <laughs> you either attend the games and go along with it, or you stay or you home. Don't. But yeah. it, it's definitely it's definitely going to happen. So for the fans out there who are not comfortable with it, I I would advise you to either get comfortable with it or start to make new plans. <laughs> Because it's wow. not going anywhere. It's really not going anywhere. I'm, no, I'm straightforward mode today. saying it's their way or the highway. And and it's true, though. I mean, you don't have to do it, right? I mean, that's what I always say when people, ah, ah, ah. and listen, I'm not saying, I, the, the data piece of it scares me because we've seen data breaches yep. all over the place. Now, especially NFL games, like I said, if you do anything you're not supposed to be doing in NFL games, I don't care whether it's, like I said, you sneak in your own booze, you smoking weed, you know, whatever you're doing, or you have a, maybe you have an outstanding warrant. <laughs> now you're going to think twice about going because, because they're scanning the whole crowd. I mean, they just are. So I think that uh, it's, it, it's interesting. I, I believe there will be, because we live in a litigious society. I believe that somebody's going to sue over it. So we'll see how that goes. But again, you know, you, you have, you have the option, just like I have the option of watching this, eating this, paying for that, not paying for it. So people are going to do it. But I thought it was interesting, the police union, and I had never thought about that. But yeah, if you're a police officer, you know, you're kind of a target in some ways more than the average person, I guess, for some. And 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 so that would that that would concern me. So I can see why the police union is trying to get more clarity. I think that's what they're really what they're doing. They're not they're going to work the games. I think they just want to understand where that data is going and maybe they can have some more input into those people that are police officers. Not that they're better than any of us. But certainly their jobs and what they do for a living makes it a little different. Regardless of what they say, a data breach could happen anyway. They could tell That's you right. it's the safest thing in the world and you just never know what could happen. Because like you said, we hear about data breaches all the time. And every time I hear about it, I'm like, I'm hoping it's not something I'm associated with or they got my you know credit card number or address or any type of information. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a that's a logical worry for anyone. Right. Um, but as I said, it's that's the way that's going to be the way of the world and it's not going to and stop will, there with, with sporting events no and i will tell you for those uh raider fans who live outside las vegas but go to las vegas a lot for games every time you step in a hotel they're doing it okay so you're it's already been done to you you've already and and, and mm -hmm. it happens in banks now across the country so so it's already happening so the fact that it's having an nfl game might be different and feel weird but if you're in Las Vegas, I mean, back my early in my my corporate PR career, I had a client in Las Vegas who worked for a company. And this was in the early days of facial recognition because obviously casinos had a desire to use it because there's people who are barred from gambling in casinos because they're cheaters. And so they have books and they would watch and you'd have to do this. And that's what they did from the surveillance room. But with facial recognition, I now knew if somebody who came in that was in the black book and I could scan the face and I knew, hey, Mo Moten's gam he's he can't gamble here. I immediately know, and I can come get you and say, "Hey, you need to leave the the the, the premises." So, so I get it. Uh, but I thought it was an interesting story. The other thing, Mo, and this brings up a, a little nit. I had some little uh, disagreements, not arguments, because everybody was respectful. But you know, we talked about the quarterbacks, the young quarterbacks, uh, last week, and and how they did well against vanilla defenses and all that stuff. J.J. McCarthy obviously did well against the Raiders. He is now out for the season because of a knee injury, which is a kick in the nuts for Minnesota. They got Sam Darnold, yes, but you know McCarthy's been looking good, so they thought maybe this kid's going to play this year. Uh, but but a lot of people, when I said this, oh well, they're playing second and third stringers. At the same time, praising Gardner Minshew, <laughs> who was playing against Humo. Some backups were out there for the Vikings, by the way. Did you see Jonathan Greener, their best edge rusher, was actually not in uniform. He was not talking uniform, to the broadcast. No. He was talking to the sideline reporter. So, you know, they're, they're backups. I mean, I get the, the comparison. There were more backups out there with J.J. McCarthy. But, sure. I mean, it, it is what it is. For With a rookie quarterback, you just want him to get some rhythm on the pro level, and, that, and they established yeah. that. So, Yeah, and a lot of I got a lot of feedback, too, about losing the game. And I can well because and we talked about the timeout stuff last 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 episode, but it's like you know it's a practice, guys. I mean I know you want to win games, but it's a it's a glorified practice. It's a lot so of practice. so the fact that Antonio Pierce wasn't doing everything to win the game or to to tighten up at the end of the game, it's like yeah, I I get why you're upset, but at the same time, 
as they get closer, the next two games, yes, I understand. You start ramping up the seriousness of things. You start tightening it up a little bit. You're still not going to open up your offense or your defense, but what you do need to do is get consistent and, and get disciplined so that you don't have penalties and that you're executing so that when you hit week one against the Chargers, you're ready to go. So be interesting. All right. Well, that's enough. Um, we're going to go get our face scanned. No, we're going to take our final break. When we come back, we're going to do a nice long Raider Nation mailbag because you guys had a lot to say. So we're going to get to that right after this break on Silver and Black Today. Don't go anywhere. Michael Vick at BetUS.com. Catch an incredible 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits plus 10% gambler's insurance. BetUS, my online sports book and casino. Enough of hearing us talk about the Raiders. It's time to hear from you. Any Oakland Raider fan, Las Vegas Raider fan, stand up. On this edition of the Raider Nation Mailbag. Got a, got a black hole rock and rolling. Don't be a wallflower. Be a part of the show. Leave your question or message by calling 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Or drop us an email at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. Yeah. All right. Welcome back. Silver and Black today. Hope you guys are doing well. Do us a favor. Make sure you follow Mo. We like to talk to you guys out there. So we're on X.com. Mo is Mo Moton, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully, the show S-N-B today. So do that. Also, check out our YouTube page. If you're one of the people up on Rumble, that's where you go. We're up on there, too. We're also Facebook. We're on TikTok, Instagram. You can follow us in all those places and get some cool content that we're putting out. And uh, a lot of it, uh, thanks to our buddies at BetUS. So make sure you check that out. All right. We're back. We're going to get right into this because we got Mo, We got so many calls on my my soundboard here. I had to do two banks of sound because we had so many callers. And we have a good buddy of ours who called in too, so we'll get to that already. All right. The first call here is Dave Casper's ghost. Now we have – what's the other one we have? Ken Stabler's ghost. ghost. Yeah. And Dave Casper is still with us, so he's not – but he is the ghost, so I think I get that, but – He's yeah. not like Stabler's ghost, which is different. So anyway, we'll get to that. But here he is. He's calling from the Hudson Valley in New York, Mo. So here he is. Hey, guys. This is Dave Casper, the ghost from the Hudson Valley of the great state of New York. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be asking a question or if I'm just going to vent or complain. <laughs> I've been a Raider fan for 45 years, so I'm old. And uh, <laughs> uh, let me backtrack a little. I got to say, your podcast is the best on on uh, with, with, with regards to uh, object objectivity to this team. Ah. There's something, some of the podcasts I listen to, you would think the Raiders are going to be a Super Bowl contender. I won't mention names, but one of them, one of the ones from, uh, uh, rhymes with the name Dondo Harpenter. Uh, anyway, uh -oh. going forward, I've been a, t a fan of this team for 45 years. I've seen a lot of good early on and then a lot of bad lately. Uh, regarding objectivity, I, I listen to their flagship station in Vegas. And if you listen to them, they're, they're, they're trying to figure out a way how this team is going to go 10, get, they're possibly 10, 11 win team and get into the playoffs. Playoffs? <laughs> you want to talk about playoffs? Right this off. team is a 6-7 win team. Mo, I think you said they are at 7-10. and 10. I completely agree. I think there are too many glaring holes in this team to get them anywhere over 500. Starting with the head coach, I'm going to be in the minority. Mm. I don't think Antonio Pierce was a good hire. If you look at historically interim coaches being hired, they have a 400 winning percentage. The only outlier is Jason Garrett. If you remove his record, then it falls into the 300s. So I don't think Pierce was a good hire. They should have moved heaven and earth to bring in Harbaugh. That's just my opinion. Maybe he didn't want to come here because they didn't have a franchise quarterback, but I would have done anything to move him, uh, get him in here. Uh, in terms of, uh, I, I just think, uh, in terms of other holes, the quarterback, obviously, the quarterback play is going to hurt this team going forward. Uh, they have weapons on offense, but I don't uh, – the running game, Zamir White, is he capable of carrying this team for 17 games? I know they might do a running back by committee. 
Uh, I just think the offense is going to struggle for the most part. The problem with this team is they're the best players are ready to win now. Uh, Devontae Adams, Max Crosby. But this team is two years away from being two years away. Uh, so I, I, I see a 6-7 win team. Um, I am I, I'm not holding out high expectations. I think their defense will be really good. But like you were pointing out in the last podcast, uh, 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 Patrick Graham's run defenses aren't that good. So I think they're going to be a lot of low-scoring games, a lot of close games. They're going to lose some games they should have won. They're going to win some games they should have lost. Oh, and there we go. Cut off on you. Dave Casper, the ghost, Hudson Valley, New York. Hey, thanks for calling in, man. And listen, um, if I could put on the second half of your call, I would. But thank you, though. And he had a lot to say. And you know what's interesting, Mo, is I know a lot of people are going to listen to that call and think it was overly negative. And even though he said he was ranting and all that, um, I think a lot of what he said actually is not overly negative. I think it's realistic. And it's a lot of the questions. Now, he's has the assumption, Dave has the assumption that 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 none of that stuff's going to go well, right? So he picks six or seven wins. Um, now, some of those things could actually go the opposite direction. So that's why I think you have them in the seven to nine win range. It makes sense because if, if quarterback play is good and the offensive line plays, I mean, there's a lot of ifs, I get it, but but I don't see any problem with there. And by the way, his, his point about Raider Nation Radio, those are all friends of ours there too. And I used to be on the station. And and I get it. Everybody's got their different points of view. So so we 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 lay it out here. Um, and I think all those guys on that station are really educated. So I know it's the flagship station and all that stuff. And so you people think what you want about that. But but overall, you're going to get various opinions, and and we're going to give you ours. And and I appreciate the the compliment. That was a big one for us because we always strive for that objectivity. So first of all, thank you, Dave Casper's Ghost, for the objectivity comment. We try to keep it ob objective here. I'm not going to criticize any other stations mm. or publications because that's just, you know, not me. They'll do what they're going to do. And I I want I want to see everyone win and do their own Absolutely. thing in their own lane, which is fine. Uh, but I'll get to the the meat of the of the call. And it's about, you know, where are the Raiders going to end up this year? Where how many wins? And I was in the seven to eight range. So you and I are very close. Dave Casper's ghost in saying that. This team is probably not going to be over the 500 mark, mostly because of, I have issues with not only the quarterback, but the offensive play caller. I've been talking about Luke Getzey and his history with the Chicago Bears, that their, his offenses weren't good. I know a lot of people want to blame Justin Fields all for the, their struggles, but it's not a one-man show. Um, Justin Fields at one point said he felt robotic in Luke Getzey's system, and Luke Getzey admitted that he had issues um, – tailoring his offense to the, his player's strengths. He admitted this. This is coming out mm -hmm. of Luke Getty's mouth, not mine. So he admitted to his faults there. So when I say that Luke Getty has a lot to prove, he understands he has a lot to prove. And he's going to have to do it with a either journeyman cornerback in Gardner Minshew or a second-year pro in Aiden O'Connell who hasn't played a full season yet. So that's going to be challenging in itself. And that and that's why I think the the projections for Dave Casper's goals and I are, are low compared to a lot of other optimistic Raider fans and I understand why they're optimistic because of what the team looked like after Antonio Pierce took over so that's the other side of it is well can they play above what they are can Antonio mm. Pierce squeeze as much out of this team as he can to get some extra wins in there and they maybe get to nine ten wins that's what a lot of Raider fans are hoping again I'm at about seven and ten eight and nine because of what I just explained quarterback offensive play caller situation and now I, I'll add into this I think they, they might have an offensive line issue, especially if Colt Miller and JPJ aren't back. DJ Glaze has been taking snaps away from Thea Mumford. I'm not saying that's a bad sign, but you, if you're tossing a rookie third rounder out there, you don't know what you're going to get out of that rookie third rounder or any rookie in the regular season because Thea Mumford is dealing with injuries to both hands. So I think the offensive line, for me, I'm starting to get a little concerned there if, if Colt Miller and JPJ aren't back yet. Yeah, and the last thing I'll say too is he he was not a supporter of hiring Antonio Pierce. And I, I understand that. I think there are more people out there who have some trepidation going into the season around that. I, I like Antonio Pierce. I love what he's brought to the team. Um, last year is a different, it was a different task, right? You had to, you had a sinking ship, you had to bail the water and get the ship back above water and have it keep sailing. And he did a pretty good job of that, I think. 
And so that's why he earned the job. That's why Mark Davis went with him and because of the attitude and the way the players rallied around him. So we'll see if that carries over. I think that's, that is another question, Mark. We won't see. He's going to make mistakes. I keep saying that, right, Mo? He's, he's, he's still going to be now. He's got Marvin Lewis around him and Tom Coughlin, these guys who can help him, but he's the shot caller, right? He's the shot caller. So we will see as things go on how things go. If, if, if we see like the timeout situation we saw, which, you know, again, I'm not trying to overblow the story against Minnesota last week. If we see that like over and over again, I say over and over a couple times where it costs them a game or something drastic happens, then you start to question that. I don't think we will. I think they'll get on the same page there. But this is why a lot of people in the national media weren't giving the Raiders a lot of love because of all these questions. Again, yes, they're not being optimistic, but what reason do they have to be optimistic? Fans can be optimistic, and that's great. We're going to be as optimistic as we can here with the performance we see, but um, that's going to be it. So uh, good good call there, though. Great call. First call, first time, Dave Casper the Ghost from New York, Hudson Valley. All right, now we're going out to some guy who keeps following me. I think he's stalking me. Here we go. Hello, Scott and Mo. This is your buddy Murph from Parts Unknown. I'm a third time, uh, long time <laughs> listener. And uh, I just wanted to bring up, well, actually, first, Scott said to be pithy when we call. I had to look that up. I didn't know what pithy was. I, I thought that was like when you're <laughs> mad or, or you're, you're pithy. Um, but anyways, but it's not. It's not being pithy. That's that's what that is. But anyways, uh, so hopefully I can be pithy. Uh, I think something that, that I didn't I don't hear you guys talk about a lot, and I don't hear a lot of Raider fans talk about a lot when it comes to comparing quarterbacks. Mm. It's not about so much the mistakes you make; it's about when. And when when you, when your your lineman gives up a bad rush, and you're sacked in the red zone, that's a bad time to take a sack. Yeah. You know, and I think that if your quarterback can get you out of plays like that, then there's a huge value there. You know, when do you throw interceptions? Where do you throw interceptions? Those kinds of things. Are you converting on third down? Where on the field are you when you're converting on third down? What's the score on the on the board set? All that kind of stuff. I think you really have to take that stuff into context. I think that's a lot of things that really got lost in the debates around the car wars, for instance. It's all about the context and the timing and the when and where. Anyway, that's all I got. I hope that was pissy. <laughs> Look forward to hearing you guys. <laughs> Love you, bye. That was, that's our buddy Murph for Raider Fan Radio. Of course, shout out to him and Swag Jeff and Michelle, of course. Uh, yes. Good stuff. And oh, great point there, man, about, it, yeah, quarterbacks, and it goes back to the O'Connell sack, the sack, obviously, in the red zone. Um, but it's a great point. It's a great point. And I actually had to write a uh, piece on my predictions for the season. I talked about number the previous number four. For the, for the Raiders, uh, the old number four. What's his name? Oh, yeah. And okay. and about how some of the times where he racked up his numbers last year with the Saints were when the Saints were trailing and the defense is playing prevent defense, soft defense. So it goes to what Murph was saying about when you take these sacks, when are you racking up these yards and touchdown passes? So I I, I think he's talking a lot about, to the the sack that Aiden O'Connell took on that first drive. So I, I, I want to get to that because a lot of people saw that as not Murph, but a lot of other Raider fans saw that as, Oh, ain't no kind doesn't have pocket presence. He took that sack. And I, and I, my response to that was, if you saw the way Dallas Turner was coming off the edge after he beat us, uh, Andrews Pete so badly. Yeah. Are we sure Gardner Minshew could have got out of that? Because he had a direct line hit was, to the quarterback. Yeah. The most athletic quarterbacks can't avoid some of the sacks. You see Lamar Jackson take sacks. You see Josh Allen take sacks. Just because you have, and again, this is not directed toward Murph, but just because you have mobility doesn't mean you can avoid every sack. Correct. Now, does, you, does it increase the possibility of you avoiding the sack or evading pressure? Absolutely. And it, and it pays to have that. It's, it's a benefit to the offense to have that, especially if you have an offensive line that's a bit leaky. And that's why I connect Merce call to the comment that I had, I had from Lawrence the third on the last show where he said, if your offensive line isn't up to par, if you've got some injuries on your offensive line, you probably want Minshew out there because he's more mobile and he can kind of mask some of those pass protection issues that you may run into with backups in on your offensive line. If your offensive line is at full strength and if you have full confidence in at most of your guys up front, then you may feel comfortable with Aiden O'Connell, even though he can't move because he'll get the good pass protection. But I think it was a great call by Murph pointing out like, look, you got to convert on third downs. Even if your offense is stinky, 
If you can convert <laughs> on third down, if you can score before the half, if you can run the two-minute drill to a T and, and still come away with points on those crucial drives, you could still have a decent offense even though you're not racking up a bunch of yards, but you're scoring at crucial times and crucial points in games. Amen. There you go. Murph, my man, thanks. Can't wait to see you when you come to Cincinnati. And we will go on. All right, we're going to P&W Orlando in Portland, Oregon. Hey, Mo, it's Scott. This is uh, P&W Orlando uh, coming from Portland, Oregon. Uh, that, is, uh, by the way, is not on fire or destroyed. <laughs> anyway, um, had a question for you guys. Uh, EVs, specifically cornerbacks. I love uh, Jack Johnson. Uh, TVD on Corey Bennett. Uh, but one concern I have with the entire room is the lack of size. Uh, mm. Jack, uh, Jack Johnson's like maybe 5'11 and so it's Corey Bennett. So I just feel like they would get up much with my bigger receivers. I know Hobbs has good size at about six feet, about 200 pounds. But, uh, what do you think? Uh, is that something we're not paying attention enough to with respect to the TV room? Um, really, uh, really interesting your comments and thoughts on that. Might be a waiting to exhale moment for Mo. <laughs> that, that's also a thing too. Uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks for all your work. Um, hopefully you guys leave X soon to an utter, utter cesspool and maybe we'll see you on thread. Okay. Thanks for <laughs> Look forward to hearing my question. Hopefully. Bye. All right. P and W Orlando. I am on threads. The show is on threads. I don't know if Mo's on threads, but, but I am and the show is. So we're there too. We're, we're everywhere. Okay, Mo, it's time for your sigh. You ready? No, no sigh <laughs> here, actually. I, no sigh. You almost got me there, Scott. But, but no, I, he's got a great point, though. What, what, what do you – I mean, we're, we see, we hear that a lot with defensive backfields in the NFL if they're undersized. Is the Raiders' defensive backfield undersized overall? I think if you compare it to other defensive backfields, secondaries, it's undersized. But mm -hmm. I made this note when the Raiders hire Patrick Graham is that – he likes those cornerbacks who are about six foot tall and athletic. He likes cornerbacks who are who are average or maybe below average height for most other quarterbacks in the league. But he likes those five eleven to six foot quarterbacks who are athletic, and that's where Dory mm. Jackson was able to fit into his system with the Giants. Uh, this is why you, you go out and grab a Jacorian Ben, who's not a tall, tall cornerback, but he's super athletic. J Jack Jones, same thing, and there there is a type. There's a type that he likes. Now, if the Raiders want some size, if they're afraid, you know, you're going up against the Denver Broncos or Cortland Sutton, uh, the Chargers, maybe they have uh, Josh Palmer, because I don't think Quentin Johnson is going to make a, a big impact. But if you want to add some size to the secondary and you're the Raiders, you're probably looking at a killer Weatherspoon who's still available on the free agent market. A killer Weatherspoon is about 6'3". Uh, so they, they could, if they felt like they needed to add some size, they could. But as far as I'm concerned right now, the way they're constructed, this is what Patrick Graham likes. He again, five foot ten to to six foot tall athleticism. That's what he likes in his cornerbacks, and that's what you see most in the field outside of Brandon Faison, who's about six two. Yep. There you go. PNW Orlando in Portland. Glad it's not burning. Good stuff. We're gonna get we'll sneak one more call in here. By the way, we're gonna go into overtime and let me explain that. We're gonna get one more call in here for our radio audience in Las Vegas listening to us on 1015 FM. Kadon and the bet in Las Vegas. But if you want to hear the rest of the calls after we sign off on the radio, then what you can do is you just head over to the podcast, subscribe to it. You can get the last segment with the call. So we're doing overtime because we have so many calls and I want to get them all in today. So we get one more here for the radio audience. And that is John in Oroville, California. Here's John. Hey, it's John Moe. It's John from Oroville, California. Just calling in, wanted to talk a little bit about our first preseason game. It was great to see the guys out there doing their thing. Wanted to give some credit to Luke Getty. I wasn't real excited mm -hmm. about that hire, but he did a pretty good job of play calling on that game. I was happy. And the quarterback play was excellent. I mean, Aiden went out there seven for nine, I think, for 70 yards plus. Nearly got in the end zone, but uh, blindside blitz took care of that. So, can't fault him for that. I thought he looked great. And Minshew, whom I really hadn't put a lot of faith into previously, I've got to give him credit. He played well. 50% uh, passing, but beyond that, I mean, he made some nice plays, scored 
two touchdowns, got a field goal on offense. That first half looked solid. I was real happy about that. Now the defense, on the other hand, uh, seemed like they were getting gashed a little bit there for a while, even the first team. So I was a little worried there, but, uh, all in all, I was really happy about the offense, and I think, you know, it'll all play out just preseason. Defense will probably be fine, but uh, the third quarterback, Anthony Brown Jr., <laughs> I just don't see it with him. I mean, one-dimensional, run-pass option guy. i got to have a guy that can throw the ball down the field if he's going to be on the roster. So I say let's get Carter Bradley some work next week, and hopefully he can show us a little something for that third spot. That's about all I got, guys. Hope you're having a great day. And uh, let's go right on. All right. There you go. John Oroville, California. Our last caller here on the radio side. Mo, we got about a minute. Uh, what do you think of there? What John had to say? Basically aligns with what I thought. Uh, offense was a pleasant surprise based on what we heard out of training camp. Defense disappointing simply because of the run defense, even with the, uh, the starters in the game. So I, I'm not too worried about the defense because one, and we've we've seen Patrick Graham's defenses in the past have have been basically mediocre, but the defense can still perform at a high level. Two, I, I think you got to give uh, a larger sample size to the starters out there. I, I'm sure they'll they'll be a little more fired up against the Dallas Cowboys, as I mentioned earlier in the show. AP said that the run defense wasn't up to par. He talked about getting out of um, running lanes, and I think they they they've hammered that at practice. I'm sure and they'll look a lot better against the Cowboys. So I'm not too worried about the defense, but pleasantly surprised about the offense. I hope it continues against the Dallas Cowboys as the Raiders have a decision to make about yes, their quarterback. They sure do. All right. Well, that's going to do it for our radio audience. Thanks for being with us here on Silver and Black today on 101.5 K-Don and the Bet in Las Vegas. Do us a favor. Subscribe to the podcast. You can hear the rest of the show because we're doing overtime. We're going into overtime to get to the rest of these callers. But we thank you for joining us. This has been Silver and Black today on the radio. We'll talk to you next week. All right. Back with our podcast and video audience. Mo, we got more calls to get to. We're just We're just rolling on. So here we go. Now we're going out to Fullerton, California. I had a lot of fun in Fullerton over the years, especially when I was in student radio and student newspaper. I used to travel down there. They were in the uh -oh. same conference as UNLV. Good stuff. The Marriott in Fullerton right next to campus. Oh, yeah. All right. Here we go. Here is Ryan in Fullerton. Hey, guys. Ryan from Fullerton, California. Um, Want to talk about Tyree Wilson again. Um, I was a little... I wanted to assess this last game because, you know, the baby steps comments and, you know, you get the mixed reports with beat writers, the YouTube shorts look good. Um, you get these quick clips and everything sounds good. Short clips look good, but then I wanted to see the game and he didn't look like seventh overall pick. And I kind of go with what you guys have been saying where it's a little concerning. I mean, it's, we're not rolling him out yet. Um, I personally think it's inevitable that he moves inside I just don't see that natural pass rush technique or the moves. Dallas Turner already looks the part. They ought to allow to. These are rookies. He looks mm -hmm. the part. They got those natural moves that sometimes it's just fluidity. It's like, you know, guys doing a crossover in basketball. They just, they, they got those certain types of moves. He just looks like, well, for, he looked like he was just trying to bull rush every play, at least with Minnesota. Um, I want to see him use his hands a little bit more. I want to see some technique. So hopefully we get some of that in the Cowboy game. But I think ultimately he's going to move inside, um, which I think could be good. Um, one guy I'm very curious to see, uh, Nesta. Um, I thought I thought he looked really good. He showed some good force in the middle. Um, I think that could be some good depth um, behind, um, you know, the three main guys that they have. Um, so, yeah, I'm just really curious to see, you know, him, him show me something else. So Raider Nathan, something else. Um, and then last note, uh, I really thought you guys' uh, live coverage of the draft was some of the best content you ever had. Um, <laughs> I thought the reaction to Brock Bowers was hilarious. Um, <laughs> Mo with the hands on his head, freaking out. Uh, I'm just curious, would you guys ever do a, a reaction to a live game, maybe just a quarter, first half? Um, I think that'd be good stuff to watch. Anyways, talk to you guys soon. Raiders. All right. Ryan and Fullerton. I love it. Uh, so, Ryan, two things real, real quickly. One, on the live stuff. So uh, what we do, Mo has his responsibilities with uh, Bleacher Report. So he after, after every game, Mo does a live, 
And then after every game, we also do a live show. I do it with Murph, who you, you heard calling earlier from Raider Fan Radio. He's my kind of voice of the fan, and he comes on with me after. And Mo drops in, too. Mo can't do it all the time, depending on what he's got working. But he drops in on the post-game show, too. And we will do some more live shows when we can fit them in when the season starts. Um, so we'll have the opportunity to do some some live reaction stuff. The game live reaction, ah, that might be fun, too. Maybe we'll do that for some members where we'll just watch – we'll watch. Uh, you know, the, the third quarter or part of it, uh, for, for the benefit of our audience. Yeah. Like he suggested, like the call suggested, I'm sorry, I forgot the name, but, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> like the Ryan, call suggested, Ryan, and Ryan, yeah. Ryan, we, we can actually do a first quarter kind of like a watch along because yeah. I, because I don't have to go live until after the game. It, right. It's fine. Like maybe now if it's a, it'll probably have to be a Thursday game or a game when the Raiders are not on Sunday because Scott has a lot of, uh work responsibilities on sunday i have yeah. a lot of work responsibilities on sunday so it probably won't happen on a sunday but maybe if we can do the thursday game um and we could just kind of watch the first quarter or maybe you know the second whatever the case may be but we can take a quarter where we can watch along with our members here or or any day that's not a sunday if if they play it <laughs> because there are games on weird days this year yeah i, I believe they play against the, the the chiefs on a weird day this year so Maybe we can fit one of those uh, games in where we can watch with uh, our members on YouTube. Well, the other thing I planned on doing, Ryan, was um, I think we'll do some live shows where we actually bring you in as a guest. Like, we'll, yeah. uh, when you guys will be in the chat and somebody wants to come on because they want to talk to us or ask a question, I'll send you a link and you'll actually connect and you'll be live video with us. So we'll do something like that as well. So stay tuned for that. And his point on Tyree Wilson, look, I'll make it quick. I know we got to move on to the next caller, but but I think, Mo, you talked about him moving inside. I think if he's going to be an impact player, if he can be an impact player with the Raiders eventually, I think it's going to be on the inside. I think you'll see him transition there. And you know what? you got two more preseason games. Let's see what he does. A uh, quick point, too, though. Ryan, you're right about the bull rush. It, it's kind of like he has one move, and he's just hoping for the best with that bull rush. He has to get in some work with Rob Leonard, the defensive line coach, and they yeah. have to expand his pass rush move set. If he can expand his pass rush move set, then he'll, I think he'll have more success. But until then, and he's just bull rushing, and and the, and the offensive linemen know it. They know, okay, Tyree Wilson, he's just going to come in with the bull rush and try to bully you. You can do that on the college level when you're bigger and faster than a lot of the offensive linemen. Can't do that in the NFL, NFL when going against grown men who are the same size as you and have the same physical or better physical profile than you do. That's right. All right. We are moving on to the next call. Before we do that, though, also, if you're listening to us, if you're watching us, you can see the phone number below, but I'll give it to those folks who are just listening. 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. If you want to get on our next show next week, I recommend waiting till after the game. So then you can kind of talk about the game and tell us what you think. Uh, but you can do that 702-900-7869. If you want to email, you could text that number too, by the way, or email us at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. All right, we roll on. We talked earlier to Dave Casper, the ghost, and now we're hearing from Stabler's ghost up in New England, where they say wicked and pa. Gully the Great <laughs> and Mostrodamus. <laughs> this is Woo! Stabler's ghost. From the Northeast, the heart of Patriots country. I'm calling to just chime in on the quarterback vibe. And I look at it like this. Aiden O'Connell is a journeyman. He got paid backup money, decent money. But did I say Aiden O'Connell? You meant Minshew. I meant Gardner Minshew. I did that before. <laughs> anyway, Minshew is, is uh, getting paid backup money. Aiden O'Connell... If we start Gardner Minshew over AOC in the first week, that is a potentially catastrophic thing for the mm. young kid. I think that if it's a tie or if it's even close, you got to go with AOC. Because if we can keep developing him and keep him positive and keep him getting reps, I think he's got a much higher ceiling and Gardner Minshew, and Gardner Minshew's been a backup his entire career. He doesn't care. He doesn't mind. I don't think that there's anything Minshew could do that would say he should start above Aiden O'Connell because I'm not of the school that believes Aiden O'Connell has no talent. I think he's got it from the neck up better than the top 
third of the uh, quarterbacks in the league and maybe even more. And I think that that could translate into Brady-like play. Oh! Okay? I've already seen a little increase in his mobility. So, if it's a tie, or even if it's not much of a tie, I say it goes to AOC. You can't ruin a kid's confidence and psyche in his second year by saying, this guy that's been around the league on four or five different teams, he's funky and he's got moxie, but we're going to start him over you. That's going to kill the kid, and I don't think that that should happen. I don't think Gardner Minshew is that much better. He's a little bit more mobile, but AOC, with a good pocket, can pick teams apart like Gardner Minshew can't because he doesn't have the arm strength. Anyway, (laughs) sorry I flubbed that up in the beginning. (laughs) Anyway, you guys are the best. I can't wait to see what we do against the Cowboys and the rest of preseason. But let's remember, folks, the games don't count, but they actually really do, (laughs) especially if you're looking at the young guys, which I'm happy with. And I'm going to end it with this. Let's go. Wow, that's a good one. He might have pulled a muscle on that one. Stabler's Ghost out in New England. Thank you for that. The best Raider call of all our call is when he does that. Oh, my God. That's so good. The best one. It's so good. Um, And, you know, I don't disagree with him. I think, and we've mentioned this several times, I think, on the show over the last few weeks, Mo, which is if it's anywhere near close to, from the competition standpoint, if they're close to one another and it's kind of like, eh, eh, I think you're, I think he's right. I think we've been saying it, which is you go with the young player because you have him. Um, he's more of a blank canvas as, 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 uh, Stables go said. So you got to give him that opportunity. Yes. The confidence thing. The only thing I would say, the only thing that separates Minshew from him at this point in my book. Yeah. There's a little bit of the play styles different. So I agree with, with Stables ghost on that. It's, it's leadership. You got to be the alpha. You got to be the alpha when you're the quarterback, right? Doesn't mean you have to be loud. Doesn't mean you have to have long hair and a mustache and live in a camper like Gardner Minshew. I'm not saying that. But I do think that's what it comes down to because at the end of the day, the coach's job's on the line, the GM's job's on the line eventually. And so you got to win football games. So if, if they get Aiden O'Connell where he's being a vocal leader on the field and he does what he has to do to lead that team, then, Mo, I absolutely 100% agree. But as we said last, and, and I got some comments on this too, I think both these quarterbacks will play – not because one is going to be doing so poorly, but it could be for various reasons, matchups and whatnot. But but I agree with him on, on his main point there. So first of all, we have Dave Casper, the ghost. We've got Ken Stable's ghost. I should just become, you know, Mo the ghost since they're all they're in the, they're in the Northeast. Like Dave is oh, out boy. there in the Hudson Valley. We yeah. got Ken Stable's ghost out there in the Northeast and Patriots country, I believe. I, I'm in New York City. I should just be Mo's ghost. I should change my X handle. And it'll be at, at Mo at Mo the Ghost. You know, maybe I'll just do that. But anyway, I to the, to the call. Town Mo. To, to, to the call, I will say I, I totally agree. And it's why I said, you know, I think Aiden O'Connell gets to start. Not because he was head and shoulders better than Minshew. It just makes more sense. Because if you want to see what Aiden O'Connell could be, you're not going to see that if he's holding the clipboard. He's got to play. <laughs> and he's only got what a half a season on his resume as, as you know, as our guy, Ken Stables ghost said, Gardner Minshew has been the situation where he's been the spot starter. He, he was that in Indianapolis uh, in Jacksonville. He was starting for a while. Then he kind of faded out and moved to the bench. He was that in Philadelphia when he got traded there with Shane Steichen. So Gardner Minshew is not an unfamiliar territory, whereas Aiden O'Connell I don't think you want to disjoint his development if it's close. Yes. If it's close, if it's a close battle, you typically, what you see around the NFL is these teams that go with the younger quarterback who may have more upside. So after playing the second half of the season as a rookie and handling it pretty well, considering the, the circumstances, why not run the continuation and see if there's some growth there in a less complex system while getting first team reps in the offseason with Devontae Adams and all of those playmakes on the field, see what you got in Aiden O'Connell. Put him out there. And if he struggles, and I know there was a call, I believe someone came, uh, commented us on Twitter that 
Uh, and Tony Pierce basically said, whoever starts week one is going to be our quarterback. Let me tell you, plans change when things happen during the season. You could say one thing, oh, our quarterback week one is going to start for the entire season. And then you go in five weeks and your quarterback has turned the ball over three times a game. You're going to pull that quarterback regardless of, of what you said in the offseason. So yeah. I, I think you start Aiden O'Connell, see what you got. And if he's not it, if he's not showing growth with five, six weeks into the year, then you throw out Garner Minshew, who's used to being in that role as a fill-in starter, and you see where he gets you. Absolutely. Stabler's Ghost, great call, man. Thanks again uh, for the kind words as well. Mo and I try to earn the money, so we appreciate that very much when we hear uh, good compliments. So thanks. All right, we're going out to Oregon now. We're going opposite coast. It's time for Screwy Louie. Hey, this is Screwy Louie in Oregon. OG. Oh, <laughs> um, I was pretty impressed with the first half of the Raiders playing Minnesota. Um, the defense looked pretty good, except for maybe stopping a few of the plays in the middle. So they got to tighten that up a little bit. But Jack Jones looked really good with that interception. And Jacorian Bennett, you were right, Mo. He's coming around. I think we don't need another corner. He's filling in the slot quite well. Um, on offense, I'd say the quarterbacks were pretty even overall. Um, O'Connell's pretty good in the pocket. Got a better arm than Minshew. Minshew's good at scrambling. So either way we go, we're going to end up better than Garoppolo um, was when he was with McDaniel. So I think we're looking pretty good. Um be interesting to see how we play against Dallas. Maybe we'll tighten up a few things. I don't know if Minshew will start or O'Connell, but either way, it's all good. I think we'll we'll be fine this season. The real test will be when they play um, the Chargers. Um, that'll be a good um, parameter to check and see um, where they're going to head, especially when they have to play Baltimore after that game. So. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping they play that game well also. Um, other than that, I don't really have any questions um, to ask. I'm just hoping that they get shored up a little bit better with some of their defense. Um, other than that, the offense wasn't too bad at all. All right. Take care. And talk to you later. Bye. All right. There's the OG. The OG screwy Louie. Right. I always got to always get when I see when I was off off tangent a little bit. When I was yeah. growing up, we always pay respects to the OGs out there. You know, I, I don't know what these kids are out there doing now right now in the streets, but we always <laughs> paid our respects to the to the older gentlemen and women out there. So respect to OG Screwy Louie. But and he, and, and he's in or he's in Oregon, so he could be the Oregon G, like the Oregon <laughs> gangster. Gosh. Go ahead. You were going to make a point, but but about his call, and I I always I want to say this about the quarterback situation, and I said this on on the X. Just because I think Aiden O'Connell is going to get the job doesn't mean that I'm dismissing Gardner Minshew and what he did on the field, right? So I don't want people to say, "Oh, Mo doesn't like Gardner Minshew because he thinks you know he thinks Aiden O'Connell is going to get the job." It's not the case. As Scurry Louie just said, I think. And I agree. I think both quarterbacks played well. I thought Gar I thought Aiden O'Connell was more consistent. He completed, you know, seven out of nine. Gardner Minshew six out of twelve on multiple drives. I think Gardner Minshew had the wild plays, the big plays, to particularly to Trey Tucker and of course the touchdown pass to DJ Turner. But I thought both quarterbacks played well. But at the same time, I don't think there was any separ separation in, in a large scale. So Antonio Pierce said that no one stood out during training camp, during the practices. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think anyone separated themselves after this game. So if you're going into the Cowboys game and thinking we have to make a decision after the Cowboys game and there's no real separation between the two, it goes back to the, the previous call, Ken, uh, Ken Stable's ghost. You're probably going to go with the younger quarterback who may have more upside. So as mm -hmm. long as it stays close, I'm going to re reiterate this point again, I think it favors – uh, Aiden O'Connell over Gardner Minshew. Not to say that Gardner Minshew didn't do well in the offseason or didn't, you know, show that he's capable. But you're looking as a coach, as a as a coach of a football team, you're looking not just at this season. And I know Raider fans don't want to hear this, but you're also looking at the future. Now, we're no one's. A lot of people are saying, you know, Aiden O'Connell is the future, 
But what if what if he has this what exponential growth? What yeah. if he has this exponential growth in his second year, right. and it makes your quarterback decision tough next offseason? Now, I would still draft a quarterback anyway. But the best case scenario, Aiden O'Connell shows this exponential growth, gets the Raiders, you know, maybe to a 500 record, perhaps to the playoffs. Who knows? And then you have a good quarterback situation where, okay, we could still draft the quarterback early, but we have this young quarterback in his second year who just played well that a lot of people doubted. So I think yeah. you want to see what's behind the mystery door. That's basically what it comes down to. What's in the mystery box? Aiden O'Connell right now <laughs> is the mystery box. And the Raiders, I think, have to scratch that itch and find out what's in it. What's his ceiling? We have to find that out. Good, good day to you, Raider Nation. It's me. Finn, the production assistant here at Silver and Black today. My gosh. Well, it was a matter of time before Jimmy G went down with an injury. Do you remember that? I just had to play that. That was the little Irish thing. The Aiden well, O'Connell thing lie. from last year. Yeah, because people say we don't like Aiden O'Connell. We had all these recordings. We had T-shirts. But anyway, no, good stuff. Uh, and um, Louie, thanks again for the call. And we're going to end the show with two calls here from some Silver and Black Today OG callers. Right? So put down your coffee or whatever you're drinking at this moment, if you're drinking something, or if you're putting something hot in your mouth, because here is Jacob from Fresno. Good. Hey. Jacob from Fresno. What's up, guy? Uh, yeah, <laughs> so I, I had a little bit of perspective this week because I know Scott and I are big Notre Dame golden blue through and through guys. Oh, you know, gosh. Well, pro probably, I I'm just guessing, you know, Scott hasn't said this personally, but he's probably like me watched the movie Rudy 150 oh, times just yesterday. <laughs> uh, so true. We're, we're big Notre Dame guys. So I, I want to give you a little bit of an illustration of what I'm thinking about the quarterback situation right now. And it's not a, a, an exact science because I think that Aiden O'Connell is actually a better passer than some of the guys I'm about to mention. But without, it, without any of that, just look. We got Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew, right? Now, Gardner Minshew seems to be the guy that has the lesser arm in terms of strength, in terms of uh, pinpoint accuracy. Uh, Aiden O'Connell's no Drew Brees or anything like that, but he's, who knows? He's young. Who knows what he's going to be? But he seems to have the stronger arm, seems to be able to put the ball where he wants to put it more consistently. Uh, but he, his darn legs just will not move. And as Notre <laughs> Dame fans, this reminds me of a guy like Jack Cohn, uh. right? And we had all these guys, Drew Pine, all these guys on the bench, on the bench who were way faster than Jack Cohn. We're thinking, ah, maybe that guy should play instead of Jack Cohn. But at the same time, Jack Cohn threw four touchdowns last week for 400 yards. I mean, he's pretty good. But once the pocket breaks down, he's there's nothing he can do. There is no thing this guy can do to keep the play going. He is a sitting duck as soon as it goes out. And that's the way we kind of think of, you know, Aiden O'Connell. And it's the same with Notre Dame, going back to uh, Tommy Reese and Everett Golson, the national championship days, right? I know that's a heartbreak to try and re relive. But Everett Golson, that guy could run all over the field. He just could not throw it like Tommy Reese could. I mean, Tommy mm. Reese wasn't anything really to write home about. He's a great coach afterwards. But still, I think that those are a perfect illustration, and that's why I'm so hard-pressed to say, who's the guy? So with that in mind, who's the guy, guys? You let me know. <laughs> Take it easy. Go for it. There you go. Jacob in Fresno, and it's no, it's no accident that Jacob in Fresno is a Notre Dame fan, though, because uh, – you know, who went to Notre Dame and is from Fresno and played for the Raiders. The Mad Bomber, Daryl LaMonica. Scurry Lou probably had that right on hand. He probably knew that. He knew that, right. So <laughs> so a lot of, lot, of, lot of Notre Dame fans up in Fresno. But, yeah, I mean, we've been talking about that uh, pretty much the whole the whole episode there, Jacob. So, But, I, again, I, I, I know Mo and I both think that uh, if, if, if it's even, it's going to be O'Connell. And if not, you'll know because one of them will pull ahead so far that it'll be undeniable. And uh, um, I don't think that'll happen. I think it's going to be a close race, and I think you go with the young guy. So we'll see how it goes. So really quick, yeah. I, I'll add a few points to that, right? So today I went back and forth, or Wednesday I went back and forth on X with, with fans who said, well, 
you know, if a if Gardner Minshew is even a little bit better than Aiden O'Connell, why don't you start Gardner Minshew if it's a true competition? Mm-hmm. And we explain why if it's close, why you go with the younger quarterback because of upside. But also, mm-hmm. I just wanted to keep um, something in mind. I had a few points that I laid out that I'll share with the audience here. Is let's remember that the Raiders star players basically chose their head coach, right? Openly campaigned to have Antonio Pierce hired. The Raiders hire Antonio Pierce. He's a defensive-minded head coach, which means he's going to lean on the offensive coaches to make the big decisions. They hire Luke Getze after Cliff Kingsbury goes to Washington, right? Yep. Luke Getze has a pre-existing relationship with Devontae Adams back from their days with the Green Bay Packers. So it would it would be logical, or in reality, you, you'd have to understand that the Raiders are going to lean on Devontae Adams' preference as far as the quarterback situation is concerned again pre-existing work relationship with luke getsy who is calling the offense and obviously luke getsy wants to highlight his star player his best playmaker on offense Devontae adams had a presser where he talked about the anticipatory throws that aiden o'connell had to jacoby myers where jacoby myers turned around the ball was right there so when we talk about ball placement accuracy I think that's something that's very important to Devonte Adams. If you watch the receiver series on Netflix, he talked about getting hit a lot on those balls where he got left out to drive from Jimmy Garoppolo, where the Jimmy Garoppolo basically led him into a defender and he got popped. So yeah. I think when it comes to ball placement and accuracy, that's huge for Devonte Adams. It's not the flashy thing to say, well, 100 yards, 100 plus yards passing. This guy had a touchdown pass. And I made this point on X that when you're evaluating quarterbacks, it goes beyond just the box score numbers. And I don't yeah. like to, to, to talk down or, or demean people, so I don't say this a lot. But when you're evaluating players, period, not just quarterbacks, you can't just look at the numbers and say, this guy's better than that guy because his numbers are better. You have to really be able to look at some of the key points of a position. With the quarterback position, as I said, anticipatory throws, ball placement, how he manages in the pocket. That's not necessarily scrambling around, but his pocket presence. Aiden O'Connell, as our guys at, at Tape Don't Lie pointed out, Marcus Johnson and Matt Holder. Aiden O'Connell has some instances where he stepped up into the pocket, whereas Gardner Minshew has some instances where he kind of left the pocket early, left the clean pocket. You don't want to see that from a quarterback. You love the mobility, but if you have a clean pocket, you want your quarterback to be able to step up and make, make accurate throws, and that's what Aiden O'Connell did on Saturday. There you go. Well said. All right, we're moving on to our last caller, our good buddy, Tarek, who always calls in most of the time. Uh, and uh, here he is. Hey, Scott. Hey, Mo. What's up, guys? This is Tarek uh, calling you guys from Chicago. Uh, just a few things from your last show. Uh, Mo, it was very uh, interesting uh, and telling uh, when you brought up Patrick Graham's uh, historic run defenses and where they ranked um each year not too good um you know i'd like to think he has some more pieces in play here this year and uh, we look good on paper and everybody all signs are pointing to a, towards a legit defense but we haven't done it yet so um the signing of nathan peterson uh let's not all get too excited i mean my goodness i mean i think that kind of shows uh where the quarterback situation's at i think when it comes to the ongoing battle between aoc and Minshew, one thing we do know about Minshew, the guy's 28 years old on his fourth football team so that that's telling AFC is relatively more unknown I uh, uh, and if it all comes down to uh you know who performs better against the Cowboys and that's definitely curious uh, I do think also that they 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 certainly know who it's going to be I still predict it's going to be AOC I have not deviated from that um he's more of an unknown and um I think the fact that AOC played less uh, against Minnesota shows that he's in the driver's seat to be the starter. Um, and I think the fact that Minshew is possibly starting against Dallas still means that AOC is in the driver's seat to be the starter. I hope it doesn't come down to um, a friendly game of best of three rock, paper, scissors to make this decision. But I do think that uh, Telesco and the uh, the coaching staff are also kind of operating under the guise of that, regardless of what either one of these guys or both of them do this upcoming season, uh, the, that the current franchise quarterback is not on the roster right now. So yeah. let me know what you guys think. Have an awesome week as we get closer and closer to taking on the Cowgirls and as we inch closer and closer towards the regular season. Have a great day, guys. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. All right. There you go. Tarek, thanks, man. And, yeah, listen, I've said, uh, and again, I've said I don't think the franchise quarterback is on the roster. Now, now we'll see what happens, right? We'll see what happens this year with Aiden O'Connell. Does he take a massive step up? and become a quarterback 
that suddenly is a guy that you think differently about your future? We'll see. I don't think it happens. I think he's going to be a good NFL quarterback. I don't think he's the guy, but we'll have to wait and see. I, I just want to put a bow on this because I know there's a mm-hmm. lot of Aiden O'Connell versus Garner Minshew factions within Raiders, within no Raider way. Nation, within Raiders Twitter. And I, and I think it was, uh, I'm going to call her Miss Hunter. I think it's Raider Lady, Raider Lady 19 if she's listening. Mm. I, I call her Miss Hunter because she's married, so I want to respect that. Okay. Uh, but she basically said, look, even though I'm a, an AOC girl, I want to see whoever gets the starting job play well. And I think that's what gets lost in a lot of this. And I had this tweet, I think, months ago where I said, you know, with this quarterback battle, you're going to get factions within Raiders Twitter where people are going to, try to prop up their guy, either Aiden O'Connell or Garner Minshew, and then talk down on the other guy. And my thing is, you don't want one guy to be way up here and the other guy to be way down here because as you and I both believe, it, it could be a situation where both guys are going to start multiple games this year. And even then, let's say something unfortunate happens and the other guy has to come in. You want both your quarterbacks to be playing at their best. And that's why I said, you know, in that preseason game, I think both quarterbacks played well in different in different ways. Uh, they both gave you yeah. something different. But if you're looking for the consistency, and again, I go back to what Devontae Adams said. I think Miss Hunter pointed this out on the X when she played the video of Devontae Adams at the press conference, talked about the ball placement on a pass of Jacoby Myers. I think that's going to weigh heavily when the when the Raiders make their quarterback decision uh, on, on this competition. But to my buddy Tarek, uh, the run defense, I didn't mean to <laughs> be the bearer of bad news there, but uh, we saw the <laughs> defense play at a high level, even with a mediocre run defense. You would hope that uh, bringing in Christian Wilkins, I still think the Raiders need a, another nose tackle behind John Jenkins, another big body in the middle to kind of beef up that interior run defense. Maybe that'll help boost some of uh, Patrick Graham's uh, run schemes, run designs, but we'll see. I, I still think uh, McCall has, has a – has a shot. Silvera, one of our callers in early in the show, said Silvera had a pretty good game. I think Silvera, Nesta J. Silvera, is ahead of Byron Young on the depth chart. I do too. And if he yeah. can get on the roster, I think he can also make an impact on every down. Yeah, it helped, I think, too, with uh, the switch over <laughs> with the coaching staff. Uh, and because he got into Josh McDaniel's doghouse. I know he's on defense and that's Patrick Graham, but whatever happened, happened. And we know that story. Yeah. So it's over now but uh but we certainly appreciate it. all right well that is it mo we got we got through them all today how about that Whew. that's what we do oh i'm gonna go that's what get we a, do go get a drink now uh but no it was good <laughs> stuff uh let everybody know what you got going uh today's thursday or sunday for listening oh no now we're just podcast your thursday you're listening to us on thursday let people know what you got coming up uh through the weekend so I'm on hiatus from X because I dropped my NFL 2024 win loss predictions. There are half the fan bases, half the NFL fan bases are upset with me right now. <laughs> and some of them are happy with me right now. I don't know how Raider Nation feels. If you agree or disagree, let me know in the DMs or whatever. I may not get back to any messages until after the Raider game, simply because I'm just kind of chilling out before things start to really ramp up. The Raiders have again have a big quarterback decision to make. You're going to start to see roster cuts and roster moves, so I have to prepare for that. I will be live Sunday, uh, not Sunday, Saturday after the Raider Definitely. game, but it will go into Sunday because it'll be 1 a.m. East Coast time when mm. the Raiders and Cowboys are done with their game. So I'll be on Saturday night into Sunday morning recapping Week Two of the preseason Raiders Cowboys. There you go. Yes, and I will not be on at 1 a.m. live with you. <laughs> Scott's got a bedtime. Time. That's going to be, yeah, well. No, well, now Sunday's fine. Saturday's the only day I actually get to sleep because I'm up at 5. You're you're up all n- in the hours of the night too, but I'm up at 5 now with the video stuff I do at Sports Not. So it's like the one day I can sleep in, man, Like, and I've not slept till 9 o'clock in the morning for years. In the last four weeks, every Saturday, 9 o'clock. Love it. Get, get a little catch up going there. Uh, but anyway, thank you all for being with us. We appreciate it very much. We'll be back next week and I might climb on and do some live video just for fun during the first half of the game um, and shoot it. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll FaceTime Mo and like do something funny or something, but we'll figure it out. But uh, we appreciate you guys subscribing to the podcast wherever you get your audio. Also, if you're watching us on YouTube, thanks for sticking around and thanks for all the great chat. Always love mixing it up with you guys in there too. 
um, and want to thank our producer, Mike Robier, and of course, Formo Moten. I'm Scott Branson. This has been Silver and Black Today. Thanks, everybody. We will see you on Tuesday. Take care.